I designed Megan to protect Katie from feeling lonely. She will recognize you as her primary user. And when you do that, you're gonna pair with her. Crazy. It's insane, right? So we have this movie, Megan, and I'm so thrilled to talk to y'all about the formation of the character of the AI doll, but my first question is very basic. When y'all were on set, if you were, what was your first interaction and your first impression when you saw the doll in, in flesh or plastic, I guess? <laughs> Well, first it was a test, right? We actually saw yeah. it before the movie yeah. even started shooting. What was your response when you first saw when, that when test? When we saw right? the Ellie test of it, I was like, holy smoke, this thing actually looks very real. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, they did this incredible animatronic head of, of well, I don't want to talk too much about it, but this animatronic head of Megan, you know, like the way she moved her eyes, the skin texture, it was pretty incredible. Uh, it was actually very exciting at the same time because, you know, up until then, you know, it's really just ideas on paper, right? On, on script form, and you're not quite sure if you're gonna be able to pull it off. So when that test came along and it proved to us that we can actually make this work, it, it took the whole movie in our heads to a whole different level. Yeah, it was exciting. We were yeah. trying to write a line so that when you're watching the movie, you are you forget for a minute that it's AI, and then you're reminded harshly that it's AI. <laughs> and the I think the movie doesn't work unless you can really suspend disbelief like that. And I think that the way that Megan was created really does that. And it's a sort of the perfect evolution of, of the, the scary doll sort of thing that we've seen in movies before, where you can even go back to the Twilight Zone episode when there's a ventriloquist dummy. Yeah. And then you have Fats from Magic. Yes. And then we have obviously Chucky and Annabelle. But this is more like it, it's the artificial intelligence, it's the technology that's making it scary as opposed to something that's paranormal. So how do you make that shift and still like maintain the scariness of it? Yeah, we, I mean, we knew that we were playing in a very established subgenre, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't go in there and move things about, right? Try new things and definitely uh, change out the engine. If the engine in the past for previous scary doll movies have been supernatural or of supernatural origin, you know, it just makes sense to kind of do something a bit different and given the state of the world and how technology is so prevalent in our everyday life, it just felt naturally that you want to go in that direction. And, uh, and listen, you know, the, the AI world can be pretty terrifying. You know, it can be incredibly useful for us as well, but, uh, but it's also pretty scary. And, uh, and of course, this being a horror film, <laughs> we're leaning more to the scary We're leaning to the scary side. side. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's almost scarier in a way than anything supernatural because I feel like we have so many supernatural-based horror movies that I know how to get myself out of that. I know I, I can call a priest, I can call an exorcist, right, right. but with this, if I lose my password, I'm screwed. <laughs> so I don't know how to how to infiltrate an AI, an AI that's gone amiss, and I think that's a really fun sandbox for y'all to play in because it's such new technology. Yeah, I think that's good. There's nowhere to hide from AI. I think that's kind of good. That'll be the tagline for the sequel. There's nowhere to hide from AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, we've become so reliant on technology that uh, that the idea that these things that we create to help us, you know, help us live our daily lives could actually turn against us. You know, it's like the classic cautionary tales that you've seen in past movies, in, in books and stuff like that. And, uh, and it, you know, it's been a while since there's been a movie like that. So it's kind of cool to kind of go back into, and especially now, you know, given how, how much more um, AI has become such a big thing in recent, recent times, right? That, uh, that, that I think this movie has become somewhat very relevant. And we think of, you know, at least uh, probably all of us when we were kids, we didn't have this AI and we didn't have streaming stuff, so you go to the video store. So when I watch a movie, I still put myself back in Blockbuster, and I'm like, well, what section does this movie fit into? I'm clearly stocking it in the horror section, but there's a lot of dark comedy in here, too. And those are the two movie types that you love going to the theater to see opening weekend, right? Because you get that instant reaction. Is that why comedy and horror work so well together? I mean, I think partially what you're saying, I think the reason it, it works well is comedy makes horror more effective. Because if you laugh in a movie, you relax and your defenses are down. And you're, you kind of forget for a second that you're going to be scared any minute. And then when the scare comes, it's much more effective because you're not ready for it. And then you laugh after the scare because everybody yeah. else in the theater just got relax. scared. And then you're then laughing you relax at yourself. Again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a common thing. You know, like when you beat up the tension, if you do it successfully, you beat up the tension and then you pay it off and the audiences end up, you know, they, they scream, they cover their eyes, and they want to release that tension by laughing at something, right? And, uh, 
and just the nature of, of Megan, you know, like the, the story of Megan, it leans into something that can be very darkly humorous and uh, to not shy away from that was important for us. Okay, so one of the humorous moments that again is still scary, but it's also you have to kind of chuckle is Megan's dance moves. <laughs> so I feel like the dance moves, I don't know if y'all had anything to do with the inspiration for that. I've never been to a wedding with you gentlemen. I don't know what it looks like, but it feels like it's a mix of like real good movements but then also, like, the drunk person at the wedding reception. <laughs> I don't know where those dance moves originate from. Half from, half from our actor, half from uh, the director, half from, half from God. I don't know where it <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, that's really it. I mean, you know, the, the great thing about what Gerard can do so well is, you know, is he can kind of walk that fine line of, you know, creating scary, suspenseful moments, but then kind of know when to have fun and do the funny bits, right? And, uh... And you know, Megan dancing, you know, they in that during that little moment before she turns dark, just adds to her personality, adds to the her sassiness. But uh, but there's so much about what she does that that makes her who she is, and, and, and that is also a, a part of um, the evolution of the story, right? She's learning things from this little girl, and this little girl is l teaching her how to sing and dance, and she's just applying that to her. Uh, her murderous ways. Yeah. yeah, the singing as well. I had the uh, the pleasure of talking with the incredible Allison Williams, who's just, who's fantastic in this movie, yeah. and asked her what pop song could Megan sing that would ruin that song for her. <laughs> she said the, a Barbie world, which is a pretty good <laughs> answer. I was thinking like maybe Megan could Rick roll us, but it, do y'all have a song that, that Megan would just completely ruin for you if you heard that creepy doll sing it? <laughs> I don't know if it will ruin it for me. I actually will probably like it even more, so I'm not the right person to ask this. If you want to give me the creepier version, I'm all for it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, I did want to briefly ask you all about, uh, you know, there, there's buzz in the industry right now. There could be a production company merging and uh, with one another. Is there is there things for horror fans to get excited about you two working more together and maybe even some, some franchises crossing over potentially in the future? Yeah, well, we're still, we're working towards... Uh, Concluding an agreement where we would be where would be two two merged companies, which would be uh, which would be really exciting. I think what it would be in store for horror fans if that happens is more great original horror movies, and then and then obviously we'd be working with IP too, but trying to keep those movies also feeling kind of fresh and new and different. I think that's one of the things that two companies do well on their own and would do even better together. We talked about Annabelle briefly, but there's been this internet beef. Apparently, Chucky is getting in his feelings about this new doll on the block. So how do we feel about Chucky sort of needling Megan online? And then how does Megan respond to that? I mean, you, these are two of arguably, along with Annabelle, the most famous scary puppets in the history of movies. So how do we settle this? I would love to see the Avengers of creepy puppet dolls. Them coming together, either um, a versus version or them teaming together. Yeah. to take on a more powerful entity. I want to see that version. Yeah, it, could, it would be the King Kong and Godzilla where they fight initially because <laughs> yeah, right. they don't know each other and then they can team up and who's going to stop not one, not two, but three scary kids dolls all together. That would be good. I, I, like I want to see that Me film. too, I yeah. do too. What is it about the that inanimate, you know, it, it's, a, it's a child's play thing. And so you two are, are, are masters of horror. Why are we so scared by that? Why does that lend itself so easily to the horror genre? Well, just because child's play, anything toy related, it's supposed to be innocent, right? And so the idea here that you come along and you corrupt this innocent object that was designed for, you know, for happy, playful things, suddenly now takes on a malevolent life. That is where the sort of, um, the sort of disconnect come from. And that's where doing things like that is kind of what makes you know, make stuff like that work on a psychological level. You know, you don't expect your doll that you love, that you grew up with, your teddy bear or whatever, to get up and try to strangle you in the middle of the night. Uh, but the idea that it could do that is what's terrifying. And I think when you're young, it, that's the objects, those are the objects that you animate. When you're young, those are the objects that you imagine are coming to life all the time that you're a kid. So even as an adult, when they actually do come to light, it's like you're, and they're bad, it's your worst fear come true. <laughs> so in your terms, is Toy Story one of the scariest franchises in it, the history? It really of is. <laughs> it truly is. Toy Story is ultimately one of the scariest. Nightmares. Movies in that, 
in the scary, the scary puppet <laughs> doll <laughs> genre. <laughs> but they're cute. They're very cute. They're they're very cute until yes. they're not, right? Until they're not. That's right. the thing about scary movies like this. So. <laughs> Uh, finally, I guess I know 2023 is going to be a huge year for both of y'all individually, then maybe together as well. What can audiences expect from your crop of movies that you're producing, you're writing, that you're working on next year? After Megan, we have uh, we have uh, Exorcist, and we have another couple couple of movies that that haven't been announced yet that hopefully will come out next year, and. Uh, I think audiences can expect um, to be scared in new and different ways. That's what I hope to always deliver in uh, in our movies. Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry. Let's just talk about it. Hey, hey, hey. Let me go. Whoa. Hey. What's going on? Hey, Katie. Go. What are you doing? Stop it. Katie, calm down. Let her go. Megan, turn off. Are you sure? So I love Megan as like the next sort of iconic horror movie villain. Who is the horror movie villain for you in your formative years that you're like, oh, that's the that's the one to stay away from. Oh, that's gosh, the scariest one. What a good question. I'm the girl from The Ring, hundred percent. Samara. Oh my God. I to this day like shower drains, televisions, like all of it is just like phones. <laughs> Scary. I like can't. She's just in there. Deeply. And I watched it a lot when it came out and too much. Wells, I just keep coming back to images from it that are scary. Cliffs. Even just her, like, combing her hair is Literally freaky. a girl. And no matter how many times I saw a scary movie, which was a lot, and I saw the parodies of it, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just haunting to see someone with long, dark hair combing their hair looking in a mirror. It's just scary. There's a little connective tissue between someone like Samara and Megan, where at first they're just like, they look like, oh, you're just like an innocent little, little girl. kid. But yeah. now something has changed. Something so has changed. The That's first right. time you were introduced to Megan in, in the plastic, like on set, yeah. what was that moment like? Well, I don't want to spoil like how Megan comes to be because I think it's better to enjoy it with some amount of the illusion. But um, uncanny, unforgettable. When I first met her, she was um, in repose, and that was deeply chilling. <laughs> she was just alone in like a corner of a sound stage. People were doing camera tests off in one side, and she was next to like a table with props. And I just walked in, and she was just standing there, and I was like. I'm not. I'm not going to survive this movie. <laughs> I'm just, this is so terrifying. Is um, there a temptation? I wonder because, like, I'm curious if you were to pair with Megan, yeah, right? Yeah. What sort of personality traits do you think Megan would would pick up from you? How would I mean, Megan change? In my dreams, she just becomes like the like most on it executive assistant, <laughs> where she knows what food I'm about to order before I I order it and it shows up. Like those are the ways I would use her. Um, I mean. The temperature thing, could she administer COVID tests? Like, that would be super useful. If she just looks at you and she's like, oh, I have bad news. And you're like, what? <laughs> she's like, there was just a COVID particle that passed in front of your face and you got it. That would be amazing. Okay, like, so she's kind of like the Alfred to your Batman. Perfectly put, please switch seats with me. That is exactly the way I would put it. But I mean, you kind of got to put some superhero oomph into this role too. So a little bit. How do? You, what is your advice if in the future we all have these yeah. AI companions and you got to tussle with one of them? How do you put fight ethics one? in there? Just program. Oh, you mean once the once everything's failed, guardrails are off, it's, we've it's messed all, up. Yeah. Go for the CPU. Okay. That's all I'll say. Go for the CPU. Okay. Yeah. And my final question, this might be the most important question that okay. you may have all day. Okay, I'm ready. So Megan does enjoy singing and performing. She does, yes. What pop song could Megan sing that would completely freak you out? I don't know. Oh, my God. I wish I had, like, an instant. I mean, Barbie Girl would be really haunting oh. to go peak millennial with it. Yeah. Like a send-up of another doll would just be sort of chilling. Okay. So Megan, maybe not a singer-dancer for you, but definitely, like, the new celebrity bodyguard. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. Honestly, a bodyguard that looks like that is sort of subverting expectations in a way I love. Don't! Stop! What the hell is that? You should probably run. I won't let anything harm you. Congratulations on the movie. Um, I wanted to ask you about Megan the doll and the first time you got to sort of be on set and see her in the flesh or plastic, as it were. I mean, it's it's funny because you there's so much that goes into making her and you're really nervous about whether or not she's she's going to come to life in the way you want her to. But um, 
you know, I, it was it was helpful to just have the the cast and crew there when we all kind of really met Megan for the first time, and you could just tell instantly by their reaction that we had something really special. Like she's hypnotizing. So there was an unveiling of Megan for everybody to kind of experience it together. Well, there was because the people who designed her, we were originally supposed to shoot the film in Montreal, and so the people who designed her uh, when we moved the filming because of COVID to New Zealand, they had to come to New Zealand, and so they unloaded her off the truck and all those things, and had to pretty her up and all. So there was a like there was a big unveiling, uh, and so and so everyone gathered around for it. And there were other aspects to Megan. There was like the Megan bot, and so we had this big show and tell of all these things. And yeah, it's like you're wheeling Hannibal Lecter down for the first time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know it was like something out of Madam Two. So I was like, I guess it, you know, it's like this thing who's kind of. Um, She's real, but she's not real, and you know. It's it's a cool hybrid doll in the movie, as as far as the premise goes with the artificial intelligence, but also just for you having the practical doll to work with. But then there's also a lot of CGI, I imagine. So so how many times was Megan actually like acting in a scene versus the CGI in post production? It was. It's hard to say the ratio. Um, I we had all the faculties we needed to make Megan on hand at all times, and sometimes it was a. Uh, it was just a difficult decision of thinking. Yeah, I remember in pre-production that it was it was so often like, oh, we should should go with this version of Megan, or should we go with this version of Megan? And there was confusion sometimes, and you'd end up on set and they'd say, oh, I thought we were making doing it with this version. It's like, oh no, oh okay, well let's just go with this version and see how it goes. And so yeah, it was very complicated. I'm curious for you, just in your formative years when you're coming into this love of film, when did you realize that, that horror, and there's a lot of comedy in this movie, so when did you realize that it was a perfect marriage sometimes in a film to get equal doses of horror and comedy? Well, my first film, um, Housebound, was like a, it was a funny idea that lent itself to being a horror movie, hence, you know, why it's a horror movie, but um, I was a horror fan, but uh, I don't think I was equipped at that time to make one. And I learned the hard way just how difficult it is to create tension and how cinematography is so important and what the camera's doing. But uh, having watched that and sat in a room full of people that are audibly reacting to everything was just intoxicating. And so the idea of doing that again, it was just, yeah, it was a no-brainer. And that's what's the, the, the greatest thing I could say about doing a, a, a comedy horror is you're well aware of how the film's going. <laughs> yeah, the audience will let you know right away. Uh, I imagine there's always going to be a response to the dance moves. And so I'm curious how you got those dance moves for Megan because it's half like super talent and then it's also just half like drunk person at a wedding. So <laughs> how do you come up with the moves? Well, I have to give credit to um, a local dance teacher who um, uh, one of the the the, the performer of that in, in the film it, it was her dance teacher it was a real it was a real family affair and you know they figured it out themselves I gave them a brief and said this is what I want and this is the timing I want this is the song I want and and we had like about seven or eight things and you know lined up but this is just the first one we got to do because we were out of time um, but it, you know it, it's yeah it's 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 yeah it's become I mean, it's just it's 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 been fun to see it just embraced, and I guess it's it's easy enough for people to do and get involved. If it was too tricky, I don't know.